begin this weekend, it's with that knowledge, and you have noticed the journal, our theme for this weekend, is sharing in the mystery of the divine life. Jesus wants you to be one with him, as he was with the Father. And so, I want to share just a thought with you. Jesus wants you to share in the mystery of his divinity, of his love. He wants you to share in his divine life. So he has called you by name. He's called you to this weekend. And so I want to say I'm glad you're here. And now these holy priests and Brother John, who is with us um, in your journals, um, session one, page number one in your journal, um, our topic is entering into the mystery of the divine life. And we've invited our holy priests to share what was the defining moment of your life when you were awakened to the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. So that you're each going to come and share with us. Father Mike Berry, would you come first? I was coming over here and I heard you saying, uh, let the fire fall, you know, and it's raining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought you'd be sure you'd be saying, baby, the rain must fall. <laughs> and you know that thing, wave in the water? Yeah. I thought you might wave in the water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are many defining moments. Life is a journey. It's a journey with Jesus Christ. And the awakening of the divine life into us, I think, is a process, an ongoing process, whereby there are times that we get a call, or a second call, or a third call. And one of the, there have been many in my life that I know of, and that I'm aware of, that I've experienced. And one of the first ones was the, the call when I was in eighth grade, second class, second class in elementary school. I think I was about 10 at the time when the, uh, the uh, teacher there, I was her pet. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you know, God wants you to be a priest. And that time, it was something of a little boy sort of looking at the sky and going to hold it in his hands. And I remember um, from then on, it was an awakening that didn't go away. It got dull for a while, you know, it got dulled and I got into, you know, other things of going to school, playing sport, all of that time. And uh, there was a young lady that um, didn't believe it either. <laughs> and, uh, but that was sort of a very strong moment at the time. And so well, it was only eight years old, you know, but it was there. And uh, it came back again um, at first, at when I was about to leave home. And my mother didn't want me to go, and my father did. <laughs> and, and, uh, my father signed the papers, but my mother finally signed the papers. But it was his wisdom. His simple faith, I think I shared this with you before, but he came to the front door, had me open the closet, open the closet, and he said, as long as I'm in the house, you know, this door will be open to you. So go and try, and if you don't like it, there'll be an open door waiting for you. And that kind of affirmed me, affirmed me like never before. My own father, my earthly father saying to me, you know, okay, we're, we're in this together. We're in this together. And then the sadness hit when halfway through he died. 
and then it was on my own. Yeah. And there was a, they sent us off to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, to the seminary at Catholic University of America, because we were the bright boys. There were three of us there. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't the bright boys at all. But as long as there were three students in the house, it was tax exempt. That was the reason we went. <laughs> and I was there, we started in September, and in January, the two other guys left. I was on my own. So, like, when I say it's a journey, there are defining moments. And I went into Superior, and I said, you know, can I recreate with, with the priests? He said, no. And I said, well, what am I going to do? Who am I going to play table tennis with? <laughs> he said, well, put the table against the wall. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but those are defining moments, you know, much more so, I think, uh, for us. Uh, and John now, as he's walking a similar journey with the priesthood and um, again to to be aware that God is with us all the time. It's all this crud that we have that we have to sort of push away. You know, I speak about the breaststroke, push it here, push it there, you know, push it out of the way so God has a chance with us. It's a journey and it's a never awakening journey. It's a never awakening journey. And uh, again, we have, uh, I don't know if you've seen that, the spiritual itinerary. Have you seen that? No? The spiritual itinerary. Yeah, that's uh, one of our um, little books on spirituality. It says we're able to go on this journey as sacred hearts because of our charism. Because of our charism. You're able to make this spiritual journey because of your faith in God because of the love in the heart of Jesus that's calling you all the time. I think today's gospel was it the call of the Twelve Apostles, calling them. He doesn't give up. He doesn't give up. And when I look back on my life as the oldest one, <laughs> I can see all the time the resistance and the power of the Holy Spirit overcoming that. And there have been many awakening moments, many defining moments. And to see it, you know, uh, happen so often, you know, should have had a V8. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>
If somebody asked me to take that path to move on into the village, and it was that move that enabled me to see something I had never seen before, and it was a big, beautiful cross. Matter of fact, you can only see it at certain times of the year because when the leaves come out on the trees, you can't see it, so it's only in the winter. And I thought to myself, that's why God makes changes in our lives, so we can see things from a different perspective. We can see things that we have never seen before. And so the Spirit awakens us to His presence through change in our lives that happen. Um, I was just, I had an opportunity to go on a tour of the Holy Land a few weeks ago. I just, I just got back and I, I brought this souvenir back with me. It's called the chest cold. <laughs> I don't think I'm contagious anymore, I hope. And uh, I got it while I was out there. But while I was visiting in the Holy Land on this tour, we visited the, the Sea of Galilee, which I, I had never been out there before, never seen the Holy Land. And I thought to myself, the Sea of Galilee is so small. It, it, it really, I would have called it a pond. Because you can see it right across. You can see all of it. You know, it's not that big at all. And I was looking at Capernaum, which we talk about, you know, at, um, in, in the scripture, Capernaum, where Jesus lived and worked. And I saw Nazareth. But especially Capernaum, we went up on the Mount of the Beatitudes, which was a 10-minute walk from Capernaum. And then there was Magdala, where Mary the Magdalene, she was from Magdala. That was another 10 minutes away. And I thought, all this stuff happened in this tiny little pond in the middle of nowhere. I thought, God changed the world in this little tiny area. And all he needed was 12 guys, fishermen, tax collector, a few women who helped out and were around with Jesus, Mary, his mother, just a few people in a little, small, backwater part of the world, and God changed the world. I thought to myself, just think of what he could do with all of us, what he could do with all of you. Um, it is God that does the work, and by seeing this area, this place I'd never been to, it just gave me a new perspective on salvation. It gave me a new perspective on what God can do and the power of God in the world. And if he could change and did change the whole world with just this, these few people from this little area, think of what he can do with all of us here today. So those were a couple of things that I, I, I became aware of through the power of the Holy Spirit and because of changes that took place in my life. One was a move from one place to another, and another one was a simple visit to the Holy Land. So, my reflection for myself and for you is if you see change coming, look out. God's going to show you a whole bunch of stuff you never saw before. So I have to give a little preamble before I get into this encounter that I had that that was transforming in my life. And that preamble is, I come from a family where we're not touchy-feely people, you know, and uh, in fact, when I look around and with my brothers and sisters now, we're always hugging each other, and we're hugging our nieces and nephews, and I thought, and sometimes I say to my sister, I said, remember when we were growing up, I said, did any of our aunts or uncles ever hug us? I said, no, not a single time can I remember. And my grandparents really weren't huggy-feely people either, you know, they didn't give us lots of hugs. But we knew that they, they loved us, so it wasn't about the fact of, of love, but so we knew up in my, in my head that we were loved, and we understood what love meant with the responsibilities we had doing chores and, and uh, doing the right things around the house and picking up and getting along with everybody else and following the rules, and of course, that was a big, very big part of it, making sure that we followed the rules and did everything. So um, having grown up in that, and then also myself, I was... I'm an introvert and I don't, I'm a very shy person, so uh, in growing up it was really hard for, it was easy for me to be around because I'm just quiet so I can just kind of be in the background and, and I always got along with everybody so I could have lots of relationships and lots of friendships, but um, we didn't, I didn't really have that environment where I would 
you know, go out and initiate uh, relationships and things like that. It was just more like being a part of something. And of course, that's part of being a guy too. It's kind of a guy thing, you know. You don't really, really, you know, you don't really understand relationships. All you understand is doing things together, you know. So you <laughs> play basketball together, you know, we're on the basketball team together. And so I have friends because we play basketball. I have friends, I had friends because I was in Boy Scouts. And so I had all these friends that were in Boy Scouts together. And then I had friends because I was in the band, and so I had all these friends that were in the band with me. So I had lots of friendships, but they were all friendships, you know, just based upon, you know, being in, involved in the same kind of groups. And uh, we, during my high school, we would, we would sit out on the quad during lunchtime, and I had a little group, I called them my Baptist buddies, because they were all Baptist, and my, one of my best friends uh, was Baptist, and now he's a Baptist minister uh, in Paradise, uh, Paradise Valley, and uh, and I was the best man at his wedding and everything. So we were uh, really good friends. And we was he was Baptist, and he had lots of friends. And we would sit around and we would talk. But so we would talk about God. We would talk about our faith. But again, we wouldn't be sharing with him about God in in sentimental you know ways. We would be thinking about God intellectually, you know, philosophically. You know, what does it mean to be a Catholic? What does it mean to be a Baptist? What is, what do you believe? Why are you a Baptist? What is, you know, and even when talking about the Word of God, you still are kind of thinking about it. What did Jesus mean? And it was very kind of cerebral. And anyhow, graduating, then graduating high school, I remember the first year of college, I went to UCSD. And I had been in, so in high school, I had been in all these different groups. And I, but I said, you know, the one group I haven't really been in is, is my church group. So I said, well, you know, I should join the church group. And so again, my idea of faith and that encounter was joining this group and being, it's kind of like a club. You know, I thought, I thought it would be like a club. You go to the CCD, they, what they call it, CC, CYO, that was it. So it was going to be CYO. But, but that's so why I, I said, well, how do, you, how, does, how do you do that? And I was kind of good at figuring things out mentally, you know, intellectually. So I said, oh, so I looked, picked up the church bulletin, and I looked, and it, there it says, well, we all invite you, and we're going to have the very first search retreat weekend uh, at the parish, and it's for young people. And so I said, well, maybe that'll be an interesting way to, to get to know people, and so go on this search retreat weekend. And the weekend was, a, was truly a profound experience for me, because being a person that was not touchy-feely, being a person that was pretty intellectual and had a philosophical idea of God, but not a real encounter with God or with Christ in the, in the spirit and in love. We went on this search retreat and all these people were giving these talks and then people were like hugging each other and there was, people were standing around holding hands and they were singing songs and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to interact in this kind of environment because I didn't grow up in that kind of environment. I was still, I'm not sure about it, but I. But one thing I did know is I, I like this. You know, uh, when we thinking about God, now I'm not just thinking about God, but there's something going on here, and it's not just belonging to a group. It's there's an an encounter, a, an encounter of something that we share in a very deep way, and that and I came to know that as the love of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit again wasn't just an idea or a concept. But now I was truly experiencing it in a very real way through these relationships that I was forming on this weekend. And of course, at the end of it, it was a wonderful experience, lots of hugging and, and love, sharing love and sharing the Holy Spirit, and, and it was great. But I figured that's for retreats, right? It's not for real life. <laughs> but then I went back next week and I went to school at UCSD, got in there with all the intellectuals at UCSD, and I was walking across the, the quad at Ravel and walking towards one of the lecture halls, and one of the, one of the team members from the retreat, she was also going to UCSD, and she was coming towards me, and I, so I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> I mean, I know on retreat everybody hugs each other, you know, but, but you don't really do that out in public. You don't do that out publicly. But sure enough, she came right up and gave me a big hug. This is this is the way that it's, it should be, you know. That and that was truly an experience for me at that time.
probably my first experience of, of the spirit. Not in an intellectual way, not in a, in a, as a concept, not as a philosophy, but as an experience, as an encounter with God and with his love through others. And, and, and of course, I, after that, I got involved and, and did 35 or 40 you know, throughout the, the next four or five years. So we were doing them all the time because we really wanted to share. And that was something unique. You know, it, when you experience this and have this encounter with Christ and this love, you want to share that love with others. And that was my, my true experience of the Holy Spirit. You know, it wasn't some strange things, but it was this true desire deep in my heart to share God's love with others and to be able to, to allow others and invite them into this experience that I had had of, in a very real way, in a very incarnational, concrete way of God's love that, that was given to me. And later on, that was probably one of the things that, that stirred me on to become a priest many, many, many years later, because there came a time where I was at a time of, of transition in my life, and I was had, thinking about what am I going to do for the future, and God took me back and says, it reminded me, you know, it's, it's kind of like God talk, when he talks to the prophets or the people, he says, remember, remember back, you know, remember when I drew you out of Egypt. Remember when I took you into the desert and spoke to you. Remember, and God says, remember all those times we had on retreat. Remember the encounters you had with others. Remember the joy that you had in sharing God's love. Remember how that felt, you know, to be filled with, with God's spirit. And I said, yeah, I remember that. So what does that have to do with the future? And God said, why don't you do that? Why don't you do that for the rest of your life? And, and that's you know, I said, well, how would I do that? I'm not, not working in the restaurants because we weren't doing that there. <laughs> but, but God says, well, you, you could be a priest. And I thought, well, no, it's, a, it's an impossible idea. Well, all of a sudden, it, it came to me that, yes, this is exactly what God had wanted for me. And I think he showed me, that's how he showed me and opened up my heart. We had a little... Yeah, I often had a little, little conflict with my father because my father never stopped being the person he was, you know, which wasn't a touchy-feely guy. So when I was trying to be more touchy-feely, he just thought I'd gone crazy, you know, that I was nuts and that I was, you know, that I was wasting my life doing these things. And, and there were some times where he had serious talks with me and says, you know, all this love and uh, touchy-feely stuff, he says, that's not, you know, that's not the real world. Is that you got to take care of yourself? You got to get out there, and, and you got to take care of, you know, one and, and look out for yourself and all. That was the way he saw the world. But I looked at that and I said, I don't want to. I don't want to live in that world. You know, I don't want to live in that world where we just have to compete with everybody. I want to live in the world I discovered on that, on the retreat, the world of God's spirit, the world where we share, where we, where we, can, where, where we are, are being a part of a community and, and we are giving life to one another. And I said, that's, that's the world I want to live in. That's the life that I want to have. And that's the life that God has gifted me with. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> when, um, when I was sort of coming back to the Catholic Church, I would go to the uh, St. John's Adoration Room a lot. Um, which is going to become like one of my favorite places uh, in the world. Um, but uh, I would just read in there or just sit in there. And I was reading a book about St. Francis of Assisi, who's probably my favorite saint. And I love St. Francis because uh, he's so detached. He's so detached from everything just for God's sake. And uh, so I was feeling really inspired. And uh, one day I went outside there and there was a homeless man, and I felt like I had to, uh, I had to, I had to talk to him. And I remember I walked back to my car because I was too scared to talk to him at first. And I got the courage, and I came back. And I just sat with him. And his name was Hastings. And uh, I just said, "Hey, you want me to go get some Jack in the Box and we can eat?" And he said, "Sure." Uh, so that was where our friendship began. And. Uh, I, uh, I guess, I guess what I want to share with you is just the, the way the Spirit moved in me to become friends with one man who was homeless, and um, 
I feel like I learned like the secret of life from making that choice to befriend this man. Because uh, it, was a, it was a journey with the Spirit, it was an awakening, it, was, it took place slowly. I had, to, I had to get to know him, and what I would do is I would take him out to eat. And uh, after weeks of talking with him, I came to this one, with one point where I was thinking to myself, uh, there's no, no other place in this world where I know I am doing God's will than when I'm with Hastings. I, I have no, I can't say for sure anywhere else, but when I'm, when I'm with him, the spirit, you know, not like in a, you know, giving me word, but giving me a wordless knowledge that he just wants, God just wants me to be with this man and just love him. And just like, you don't have to judge him. God, I don't want you to judge this man. I just want you to look at him the way I look at him. And, uh, so, and I became like really close with him. I actually was ended up being his sponsor to bring him into the um, confirmation. And, uh, but um, yeah, it was uh, I think Saint Francis interceding for me because um, I was so inspired by um, being willing to do something that people didn't usually do. Like Francis went out and he kissed the leper at the road, um, and I was, I was like, uh, at first I remember thinking, okay, I hope my friends don't see me around with this guy because they're gonna think I lost my mind. <laughs> and uh, I remember like being ashamed, feeling that way, but that's how I felt. We would go to the beach, walking or something like that, and uh, but uh, like that detachment I got from it was so awesome. Because after a while, I was like, yeah, this is like what I'm all about now. I, I, I got the secret of life, you know. Um, the secret is just um, try to love as God loves. And in that experience, it's really, like the spirit is so multidimensional. It's, it's like I'm trying to love Hastings, but somehow I'm loving Jesus. And somehow I'm seeing the way Jesus loves me because I'm trying to love this guy and I, I can't see anything wrong with him because I have just come to be so, like, I really love him, you know? And I can't see any flaws in him, and I'm like, oh, this is how the Lord sees us. Um, so I got so much from this little spark at the adoration room. I guess I was making the right choice going there. And, uh, I can't take too much credit for it, because I always uh, wanted to be like St. Francis, and just made a little step and God did the rest. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> okay, just a second. <laughs> Let me get my act together. In, um, in 1978, God healed me of what the doctor said was an incurable disease. And it came about because uh, Graham DeRay, who was a neighbor and I loved her so much, uh, said, Angie, would you take me in? There's this priest in Los Angeles who prays for people. And she had had a stroke and she wanted to be prayed for. And so I said, sure, Graham. And so I, um, I picked her up on a Saturday morning early and we went down to what I know now as the Claritians, Claritian Center in Los Angeles and Father Aloysius was there and he was simply praying for people. Um, I hadn't seen this before except to say the only familiar things, there were probably about maybe 15 people there, I'm not sure, and we, uh, we came up to the front, he came in and he said a few things but he had quite an accent and I really wasn't sure what he was talking about, but he had us kind of um, stand in a semicircle, and I was familiar with that because that's how we used to, pre-Vatican II, receive communion. We would stand in our little church in a semicircle, and the priest would come and give us Holy Communion. And so I helped Graham up to the front and stood there with her, and um, <clears throat> Father Aloysius blessed everybody, laid his hands on them, and prayed I thought in maybe Italian or some language that he knew. And um, I didn't know it was praying in tongues at the time. 
I thought, oh, he's Italian, and so he's praying in his own language. So anyway, he prayed for everybody, and he came, and he blessed Graham. He laid his hands on her, and he started to walk away, and then he turned, and he said, and you. And I had not gone for prayer to be healed. I, it, I wasn't familiar with it. And so he turned, and he said, and you. And so he blessed me. I, I had pain 24-7. And uh, it was sometimes really intense, and this was for five years. When he prayed for me, I still had the pain. And um, Graham and I, she didn't have any change in her body that I could see. And uh, I guess God didn't want us to see the change in our body until we saw the change in our hearts. But I took her home. We had lunch, and it was a nice day. And... The next morning, I was sitting in our little condo. Kenny and I lived in Covina uh, at the time. And um, all of a sudden, I was just sitting there, and all of a sudden, the pain stopped. And the pain was on one side of my face. And I went, the pain stopped, but then it started. And then pretty soon, I had minutes uh, without pain and hours without pain. And pretty soon, over a six-month period, I had no pain. And about that time, we moved to San Diego area, and my husband was transferred to General Dynamics um, Electronics Division. And um, anyway, it was a time in my life that I didn't work for the first time. And so I thought, what can I do? I want to do something for God. He's healed me. I mean, what can I do for God? I, I want to do His will. And then I'm thinking, I don't know what His will is. I don't know. Everybody says, let's do the will of God. You should do the will of God. But what is his will? I didn't know. And so I thought, I need to have a Bible study. I need to learn what is God's will. I know what I'll do for God. I'll teach catechism. So I called Mary Star of the Sea in La Jolla, because we lived there for a year. And I called and I said, on Monday morning, of course. I always do everything on Monday morning. Start new things, new ventures. And so I called and I said to the person, I would like to volunteer to teach catechism. Silence. I didn't know if she dropped dead. A volunteer actually calling. And so I then she was silent and she said, Well, dear, we don't call it catechism anymore. We call it the confraternity of Christian doctrine. I said, Oh, whatever. But I said, I said, God healed me and I want to do something for him. She said, Well, by coincidence. And I knew then, from that moment on, there was a God incident in my life. And in that time, she said, just by coincidence, on Thursday, there is a basic catechist course starting um, at Our Mother of Confidence, which was the next town over. So I said, okay, so I went. And there were things that happened in the class because I was so hungry to know God. And I was so shy. I was embarrassed to speak in front of people. And, but God called me to step out in different ways. And um, anyway, God healed me, and I took the basic catechist course, and I just hungered to know more about God. I wanted to do a Bible study. I thought if I could just do a Bible study, I could understand what God wanted. And there was this, we broke up, that's Sister Carlotta and Father Bill McKay. They taught that class. And one night they said, we want you to pretend, we were in the Cold War at that time, 78. We want you to pretend that all of the Bibles have been taken by the Russians and piled in the center of the town and burned. And now, we want to know how much of God's Word do you have written on your hearts? You should have God's Word written on your heart. I thought, okay. So we're in my small group. My small group had papers. Do you see how this looks? Do you see anything on it? Well, that was our group. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought, well, how about that? Whatsoever you do to the least of my people, that you do unto me. And this woman who went to Bible study said, that's not a scripture, that's a song. <laughs> I said, okay. So anyway, I, at that time, being a Catholic, did not know the Our Father was in the Bible. I didn't know the Hail Mary was in the Bible. I didn't know the Ten Commandments were in the Bible. I didn't know the Beatitudes. And of course, all through my catechism years, once a week, because we didn't live in a town that had a Catholic school, I went to catechism once a week, and we memorized all these things. I didn't know that I knew what was in the Word of God and those sacred scriptures. 
And so anyway, I said to this girl, who didn't know that was a scripture, I wish I could go to a Bible study. I really need to know God. I need to know what his will is for me. And she said, well, I go to a Bible study. I thought, really? <laughs> okay, so she invited me. She said, well, uh, you can only come on certain days. And so she invited me, so I went. And I was doing my Bible study. And I came across, I was, we were living in a condo in La Jolla. And I came across this, um, this question in the lesson. Now, I don't even remember what this question was. But I came to the scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I thought, wait a second. I thought I had to earn my way to heaven. I thought I had to be good. I knew I wasn't, so I wasn't sure where I was going. And then I, I knew that you had to do good things, because that's what my mother said, and I thought that's what the church taught. And if you did good things, you could earn your way to heaven. Nobody had told me that I was saved by grace. Well, I was so excited about it. I was so excited about it. This was a true awakening in me. I got so excited. And then the next question was, Jesus wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to invite him into your heart. And they gave us that scripture in Revelation. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open the door, I, not, will open the door when I call, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Well, you know, I thought, now later in years, I thought, wow, is that a Catholic thing? He's going to let us eat with him. And now we know we eat him. Wow, what a thing. But in the meantime, I said, okay, I'm going to invite Jesus into my heart because that's what the Bible said he asked me to do. So I said, Lord Jesus, and with all honesty, as best I could, made one of those good act of contritions. No. <laughs> Just ask the Lord to forgive me because if I was going to invite him in, I wanted to be so I invited him into my heart. I think I've lost my battery. Can you all hear me if I talk? No. no. I think um, Levi said, oh, sure. So anyway, I uh, invited Jesus into my heart. I sat there and I remember that as I did, I all of a sudden had this sense of his presence with me. It was as if I had entered into a place. Have you ever seen that commercial? I think it was for Claire to say, I don't know much about Claritin, but on, on the commercial, on TV, it shows everything kind of foggy, and then all of a sudden this woman takes this pill, and everything is clear as a bell. Have you seen that? Well, that's what it was like for me. It seemed like everything was brighter and more beautiful, and the sky was bluer, and it was as if I stepped through a curtain that allowed me to see God's beauty. And I would look back, and it would never change again. It was always the same for me. And so I said, wow, God's grace is amazing. He is amazing. He is so amazing. Look, he, I don't have to earn my way to heaven. He saved me by grace. Now, why did my mother make me make all those meals for people, help clean their houses, go do the fiesta? I said, the priest wanted you to know that you had to work your way to heaven, otherwise nobody would work at the festival. So. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> But seriously, I was so excited. I couldn't. I could hardly wait to tell somebody. And Kenny was at work, and he was coming home till late. And I went around the house singing, "Amazing Grace." How I had no neighbors. I went around singing, and it was so late. And I, went, I thought, "Wow, no wonder that guy wrote that song. It's Amazing Grace. His grace is amazing. He saved us. He sent Jesus to save us." And wow. 
So when Kenny came home, I remember he came home late and I already had my little flannel nightgown on like I hardly wait till he could come home. And I had dinner on the table, it was really, really late. And he came and he was so tired and I remember he had his coat over his shoulder and he, he came to the door. I ran, I heard him, I opened the door, I said, honey, you'll never believe what happened today. Well, he knew I hardly knew anybody, nobody in the town. And he said, what happened? I said, honey, I invited Jesus into my heart today and I've been saved by God's grace. And he said, well, that's nice. <laughs> he was so tired and I said, honey, he, I wouldn't let him sit down until he invited Jesus into his heart. And he wasn't gonna eat dinner until he did. And he was willing, <laughs> so we journeyed together in, in a certain way. Um, but it was really exciting. And then at that point, I knew there was more for me. I knew that I'd loved Jesus from the time I was a little girl. I knew now that I had the joy of my salvation, that I could celebrate all of the time that I had this relationship with Jesus. What was missing? I didn't know. What was missing? And it was another awakening for me. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I read this book by uh, Harold Hill, and he talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and all of these exciting things. And I mean, when he would lay hands on the sick, they would fall over, they would be healed. And I had been healed myself, so I know what the possibility. And so I was so excited. I read this book and I thought, oh, I really want that. I really want, I want to pray in tongues. I want to do everything, uh, that everything that God has for me, I want. And so, I began to just check it out. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I began to realize it is this adult relationship with God where I yield my life to Him and I let Him lead me and guide me and I ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit. And so I want to tell you tonight that Jesus, when He spoke to the people, he said, I'm going to send you the promise of my Father. I'm going to send you another advocate. I'm going to send you the Spirit of Truth. He made these promises of the Holy Spirit. And in St. Luke it says, uh, ask for the Holy Spirit. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. The scripture goes on to say, and how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we need to ask for the Holy Spirit because lives are transformed and changed when we do. When I asked for the Holy Spirit, I was really transformed. But when they prayed for me, it was like, is that it? And then, the next day, I was sitting at the table. Sounds similar. I was sitting at the table, and I remember it was January, and it was warm outside. That was, it was when Kenny mowed the lawn. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and he came in, sweaty and hot, because I was at the kitchen table, and all of a sudden I wanted, I wanted to pray out loud. I wanted to tell God that I loved him. I wanted to pray out loud, and I wanted a prayer language. But all, I, I thought, okay, I'll just read my Bible. I'll just read it out loud. So I turned, and I opened up to the Our Father, and I started reading it. And then I began, and I thought, I think that's, I think that I, that's praying in tongues. I think I have a prayer line. I think that's praying in tongues. And so Kenny came in about that time, was hot and sweaty, and, honey, is everything okay? Because he could tell something had just happened to me. I said, honey, I think I got the gift of tongues. He said, oh my God, oh my God, what is happening to my wife? <laughs> and so anyway, he, said, he told me later, he said, he thought I was gonna be so holy that we couldn't be married anymore. <laughs> So anyway, we, I shared with him, he said, but he knew one thing. He said, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. If this is the Holy Spirit, God's going to tell us if this is from the Spirit. So we agreed, and I went on my merry way just so blessed. In the meantime, I went to a mission at the Old St. John's Church in Encinitas. And uh, on that Friday, it was a Friday of the mission, and the priest pointed and said, and you must go into your homes and start sharing scripture with other people, share the word of God with them, and pray with them. But when he said that, I thought an arrow had pierced my heart. And I th I, all I said was, yes, Lord. I went home, I thought it was a personal call for me. 
anyway, I guess it must have been some call for me. And so I went home, I drove home, I didn't even pull into the garage, I got out of my car, and I went onto our cul-de-sac street, and I knocked on every door, and I said, would, this was a Friday, would you like to come and have prayer and share uh, scripture study with me Monday? And they all did. I had 35 ladies. So sure, we'll come have coffee. They thought I would make some treat for them. And I did. And so that's how Women's Christian Fellowship began in October of 1979. So we've been meeting for October 38 years, was October. And so the God work happens in spite of us. When we just say yes or God changes us. He awakens new things in us. He awakens that desire to know him, just to know him, to let his Holy Spirit fill us in some way. Um, what is that baptism of the Holy Spirit? We say, well, it is that yes to the Lord. It becomes an everyday desire to serve God, to say yes to him, and to allow him to have his way. And so anyway, um, tonight we would like to invite you to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those of you who haven't yet, to come up and um, let us pray for you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to empower us. And uh, when Pentecost came, the, the apostles in the upper room and all the people, the believers, the Blessed Mother, 120 people in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came down upon them like a great wind, and, and tons of fire came on them, and they, they all were so astounded, and they went out into the streets, they began to pray in tongues, and I want to just share just a little bit for you, because, with you, because before we begin to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to just share, there's a little bit of difference between praying in tongues and speaking in tongues. Praying in tongues in the Gospel of Mark, it says it's going to be one of the signs associated with believers. That's all believers, okay? But speaking in tongues, according to the to uh, Corinthians, is a charismatic gift. Whereas we are praying in tongues, praying, allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through us, in us, and we are worshiping and praying to the Father. When we pray to the Father, and we are in community. It generally happens in community that Spirit of God comes down to speak through us to community. And it is a charism, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now it comes in community and there's always an interpretation if they are speaking in tongues in that charismatic gift. <clears throat> Whereas prayer in tongues, St. Paul says, I pray in the Spirit at all times in Ephesians. And he always prayed in the Spirit. So praying in the Spirit is the Holy Spirit in us, worshiping God. And in Romans 8, 26, it says this, that when we pray and we don't know how to pray, and oftentimes I'm in that position, when we don't know how to pray, Romans 26 says, the Holy Spirit too comes to help us in our weakness. For when we cannot choose words in order to pray properly, the Holy Spirit himself expresses our plea in a way that could never be put into words. And God, who knows everything in our hearts, knows perfectly well what he means. And that the pleas of the saints expressed by the Holy Spirit are according to the mind and will of God. So when we're praying in tongues, we don't know what we're saying, but God does. We're worshiping him, we're praying for somebody, laying hands on them, and um, sometimes you know that's really... An important thing because you have families you want to pray for them and you want to be empowered and the only way to be empowered is to yield to the Holy Spirit when the angel Gabriel spoke to the Blessed Virgin Mary and said hail Mary you're full of grace he told her what was going to happen and so he over the Lord overshadowed her with the Holy Spirit and she was filled with Jesus we become overshadowed when we pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. We don't bear Jesus in the flesh, but then we begin to bear him to others in love, in the Spirit, because he will come guide us, and he will come into us, and the scriptures say we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't understand the mystery, but it doesn't mean that we can't walk in it.